is a large stage. <laughs> Before I begin, I must give you a warning. My message is not for the Lady of Leisure. It's for the busy, hardworking, dedicated, self-sacrificing mother who needs a little encouragement. Now somewhere it is written that a mother is only a woman, but she needs the love of Jacob, the patience of Job, the wisdom of Moses, and the faithfulness of Joseph, and the devotion of Daniel. But not only does she need to have all these things, she must have them all at once. And often, when she is quite young, and too often, but she's had no previous experience of any kind for the marvelously varied duties she has to perform. Well, before she marries, a young lady does not imagine herself facing the difficulties of managing the complicated workings of a household. Untried responsibilities come upon her as soon as she does marry. And perhaps, just as she is grasping the situation, her first child is born and fills her whole heart. Then, not only her own health, but that of another's depends on how she manages her life. The question of child training and how to bring up children becomes a new study and a practical concern. And then another child is born, who eventually becomes a sunny companion for the first. But it seems that with each passing year, a mother's job description is revised. The desire for her husband's love and friendship is still strong, but a careful division of her attention is given over to the various aspects of maintaining a happy and well-managed home. Time alone with her husband now seems to have to be either previously planned moments or stolen ones. There are holiday celebrations to arrange, extended family parties and visits, church functions, occasions for neighborly hospitality, etc. And in the center of it all is one little woman. As the children approach their years of more formal education, then there's the organization of the homeschool. And thus, she walks over new ground again. Is it a wonder a homeschool mother feels overwhelmed? She wears herself out in her efforts to be dietitian, laundress, hostess, taxi driver, teacher, wife, mother. She forgets that she needs a little time for herself. And it is then that she stops growing spiritually and mentally. Physically, she feels ragged and drags through the day until without being able to mark the hour it began, she lives with depression. Her mind is a drifting fog when she wants it to think clearly and efficiently. And with the distractions of her multifaceted duties, she's unable to follow a train of thought. She considers herself hopelessly behind in everything. Her feet are in the quagmire, and it takes an incredible amount of effort to keep up appearances. You know, to wear that winsome countenance that all the heroines do in all of Jane Austen's novels. <laughs> if I hadn't experienced these symptoms myself, I wouldn't be standing here today speaking to you. Therefore, I can emphasize and validate the need for what I call mother culture. Mommy, ma, 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 mama. Can you remember how heartwarming it was when your first child said your name? <laughs> Try to think back. <laughs> In so many languages in the world, mother starts with the letter M, be it Chinese, French, German, Italian, Norwegian, Russian, or Hindi. And probably at every moment of the day all over the world, some child is calling out mother. And I remember one particular week that my husband was away on a business trip. My children were all small then. And at the end of that week, I caught myself telling one of my children, ooh, don't say that. Don't say what, mommy? I almost said, don't say my name. <laughs> but it was then that I decided to teach my children to use the word daddy more often. <laughs> <clears throat> Some mothers say, I have no time for myself. Others, I don't think it's right to think of myself. 
Well, such mothers are stuck in a rut of self-sacrifice to the extent that they're starving themselves, spiritually, mentally, and consequently emotionally. Their children will grow up and eventually carry the attitude that they know more than mother on all points. But a fresh wind of change will revive you when you participate in what I call mother culture. The only way to make room for mother culture is to be so deeply impressed with the necessity of growing that we make it an aim in life. Now, Nancy Reagan said something like this, women are like tea bags. You know how strong they are when they get into hot water. Maybe homeschool is hot water for you. How can we women be strong through trying circumstances? Well, this is one thing I found to be true. God blesses us with his strength if we take some time in renewing our minds and if we pray. I like to use Sunday as a day to build spiritual stamina. It's a day set apart for me to look forward to being nearer to God. I like to take long walks, perhaps, and look at God's creation. A little Mary was four years old and she was busy ironing her doll's new dress on a Sunday afternoon. And her older sister walked in on her. Mary, what are you doing? You know that it's a sin to work on the Lord's day. Well, Mary looked up calmly and she answered, it's okay, God knows this iron isn't hot. <laughs> she was playing, not working. Now, I know that you could use Sunday afternoon to get a pile of laundry done or go shopping at the mall or make some money at your home business. We women have strong urges to survive and to prosper, to have money and to deal with problems and to be productive. David F. Ford in his book, The Shape of Living, says this, quote, none of these things are wrong, but just because they are so basic and good, they can become idols, absorbing all our time and energy. The Sabbath interrupts this idolatry and challenges whatever other than God that threatens to dominate our time." Unquote. So you see, it is very right to find time for yourself, for a little play and recreation, for spiritual renewal, especially when so many others depend on you. Now have you noticed that homeschooling stretches you? When much is expected of you and you rise to the occasion, you grow. So it's not just your children that grow in homeschooling, it's you. Homeschooling deepens your character and it adds to your personality. Homeschooling is good for you. Now over the years, mothers who have written to me tell of the joy that they have had in learning alongside their children, things that they missed in their own childhood. I've experienced this myself, and many of you here today are probably experiencing it, and really delving into books that you've never read before. Well, this is something, and it's a good something, but it's not enough. Let us not miss taking just a little time for ourselves. We need to take persistence to find a little time for ourselves, especially if our lives are hectic and hurried, and we have Learn to live off of adrenaline in place of that highly practical virtue, fortitude. <gasps> Look at the time. Girls, get in the car right now. Okay, you're going to be late for your child lessons if you don't move them right now. Okay, where are my keys? Here's where. Where's your brother? Is he upstairs still? Okay, here's the key. Start the car for me. Don't forget your cello as we get in the car. <laughs> well, I like this quote by William Penn. He says, in the rush and noise of life, as you have intervals, be still. Wait upon God and feel his good presence, and this will carry you evenly through your day's business. And that was the colonial days. <laughs> now, in the rhythms of time and work and rest, these rhythms are of immense importance to the life of a homeschool mother. And this is why I used to take a special time of the day when my children were very little, 10 minutes just for myself. And if you set aside this little 10 minutes every day, your children will get used to it. They'll grow accustomed to you doing it. I used to set one of those portable timers, the kind that go off by themselves. They have a real actual bell in them. And you put it in the middle of the hall upstairs. And the children were all in their little quiet time spots. Some were reading, some were building, um, some were dressing their dolls. And I told them that when the buzzer goes off, 
you can find mommy. <laughs> it was a sort of hide and seek game. <laughs> I first said it for 10 minutes, but then over time, you just do it a little longer, a little longer, and one day I had 30 minutes of uninterrupted time to think for myself. Then we moved and life became hectic again. But have you heard of the gardener, Ruth Stout? Well, she talked about living in Kansas as one of six children, and in the winters the house was pretty cold except near the only source of heat, which was a fire in the wood stove. And after supper, dishes were washed. Her mother would take 20 minutes to read by the fire every night without fail. She couldn't go off to the privacy of her bedroom because it was way too cold in there. So she sat with her family all around her. But to teach her little ones not to interrupt her, she would keep a bowl of cold water and a washcloth beside her. And when a child came up to ask her a question, she'd say, come a little closer, honey. You've got dirt on your face. Let me wash it for you. <laughs> and the children soon learned to keep their distance just for that 20 minutes. <laughs> now, the habit of grown-ups reading what Charlotte Mason called living books and retaining the power to digest them will be lost if we refuse to give just a little time for mother culture. A wise woman and admired mother and wife when asked how with her weak physical health and many demands upon her time managed to read so much. She said, well, besides my Bible, I always keep three books by my bedside that I'd like to read. But I just pick up the one I feel fit for. The three different books. One might be a really meaty book of sermons. Another one might be a book of poetry. Another one might be a little novel. But whatever you feel fit for, pick it up, just for 15 minutes. Because that's the secret. The secret is to always have something to grow by and to keep it handy. This is not a selfish thing to do, because the advantage does not end with yourself. An old countryman said, whatever's down in the well is going to come up in the bucket. So let's not let the water in our wells grow stagnant or, be, or freeze over, because we mothers will make trouble for ourselves later on in life by shutting up our minds in the present. We need to make mother culture a habit. We should continually take our minds out of the laundry bag of perplexities and give our minds some fresh soaking in what keeps it growing. So mother culture is living the educational life with our children and enjoying it, but it's also learning alongside of them. Well, why not have a shelf of mommy's books? Let the family listen to mommy's music occasionally, or watch mom and dad play mommy's game of badminton or croquet. You know, those low-impact sports, the ones you can play in a dress if you really wanted to. <laughs> well, perhaps you visited my book table, and you may have wondered why there's this funny little odd pile of mittens sitting there. Well, I brought them there for your sake, because knitting steadies my nerves, and it gives me that satisfying feeling that I've made something. So if I'm boastful about my mittens at this conference, it's for your sake. It's to give you a reminder that you too can take a little time to be creative. Some mothers like to weave, sew, quilt, spin, paint pictures, make a nature diary, uh, do greeting cards. And when they do, their children will look up to their creativity. Well, let's look at another aspect of mother culture. A few years ago, I was asked to give a talk at a mother-daughter tea party. And when I wrote down some ideas for the talk, this song came to mind that I must have heard sometime during my growing up. It's, it was called, I Enjoy Being a Girl. And while the girl is singing it, the sky is blue above her, and the, there's a warm breeze blowing in her hair, and in her summer dress. I, I'm pretty sure that in the musical she was wearing a dress, or maybe that was Oklahoma. Anyway, I don't think the song would have had the same effect if she was wearing a very tight pair of blue jeans. Do you? Speaking of dresses, um, there's a Norman Rockwell picture from the 1950s called Tomboy, and the girl has rolled up blue jeans, and she's holding this very fancy, frilly white dress in front of her that she's probably going to have to wear to some dance or someplace. 
And the look on her face is just one of, how am I going to do this? And the sad thing is that I think this is what many girls feel when they're wearing just an ordinary skirt or just an ordinary dress, something that doesn't even have laces, ruffles, or bows. I think it's a pity that girls have to feel that they're getting dressed up just because they're wearing something other than blue jeans and a t-shirt. Now, my son read the story Swiss Family Robinson. You're probably familiar with it. It's this delightful children's classic about a family that is shipwrecked on a tropical island. There are four boys in the family, Hans, Fritz, Jack, and Ernest. My son was very impressed with the father, who happens to be incredibly knowledgeable about survival, utilizing all the natural resources of the island for his family's comfort. His resourcefulness is actually comical. Now, the mother is also industrious. She cares for her family. But here's something interesting to note. She is the only example her sons have of femininity on the island. So I asked myself, am I a good example of femininity to my son as well as my daughters? I'm not the only adult female in their lives, but I am the most influential. Now, to be feminine may not mean we ladies need to throw away all our blue jeans. That's not what I'm saying. I own a pair myself. Um, <laughs> and my girls wear them when they ride horses, go sledding in the snow, and snowshoeing in Maine, and things like that. And I, you know, I tried shoveling out the chicken coop one time during mud season in a long blue jean skirt, and it was not a good idea. <laughs> Something that, could have, that I could have tucked into my Wellington boots would have been a much better choice. <laughs> but how did we women get to wearing blue jeans for almost every occasion? I've been trying to wean myself off the things for years. And I've had to consciously tell myself, no, you can wear a skirt today. So here's my question. Do you and your daughters enjoy being a girl? Here in America, general neutrality makes the distinctive roles of male and female more and more blurred. Young people are growing up with a vague idea of what it means to be masculine or feminine. We can even go as far as saying that the modern world is robbing women of their femininity. Is it a wonder that so many women are depressed? Now, I know I'm walking on thin ice when I mention this next word, husbands. Husbands, I'll say it louder. <laughs> but I do have good things to say. And I'll only ruffle just a few feathers, I think, a few more feathers. <laughs> For almost 50 years, men have been belittled. The dad in the Bernstein Bear family is only one of the many laughable dads portrayed in today's society. He's cute, though. Mother bears have it all together. Indeed, it is the fashion for a man to act less manly. It is the acceptable norm. When was the last time that the average man on the street opened a door for you or tipped his hat to you? I had a, an older man do it to me hmm, about 10 years ago. He's probably a World War II veteran, and it felt so nice. But it hasn't been done since. I think it was the only time it ever happened to me. We Christian women are sometimes drawn in by worldly influences to think that it is our right to be independent of these silly men. The Mary Tyler Moore show way back in the 70s, I was brought up with that, was just one television sitcom that celebrated the independent woman. She may live in a man's world, but who needs men? On the contrary, if we read the word of God, we find that the one was made for the other. The old 1950s expression, who wears the pants in your family, or who's the boss, barely is even understood today, because everybody wears the pants, so to speak, and everybody does what he likes. But this does not follow God's design. Are you familiar with that musical, My Fair Lady? In it, Professor Higgins sings a song of frustration. Let a woman in your life, he says, and your serenity is through. Shall we decorate your home from the cellar to the dome and then go on to the enthralling fun of overhauling you? Let a woman in your life and you invite internal strife. She will beg you for advice. Your reply will be concise. She will listen very nicely, then go out to do precisely as she likes. <laughs> 
I'd prefer a new edition of the Spanish Inquisition, he says, than to ever let a woman in my life. Well, he's telling his fellows why he's a confirmed bachelor, but you know the end of the story. There's a happy ending to it. Well, I must say, admit that my husband and I have a small business, and we've had it for over 10 years, and it's grown. So some years ago, Dean was able to leave outside employment and come home to work full-time at home. And he's home all day. <laughs> and one week, I was startled by a conviction. I realized that I was asking my husband to do far more things than I would ever dream of asking him to do. Now, I may have a soft voice, but a voice still it is. <laughs> and I was convicted to alter my behavior. See, part of mother culture is playing a role. It's following God's beautiful and glorious plan as a wife and mother. And it's giving place to our husbands. They are the head of the family. He is to wear the pants in the family. And being ladylike is part of being the person that God has designed us to be. Well, since we're on the subject of husbands, I'd like to introduce you to my husband, Dean Andriola. We've been married this March. We've been married for 25 years. Here's another thought about mother culture. My son Nigel asked me the other day, Ma, what's the lowest paying job? <laughs> now, at first I told him it was the occupation of making french fries at a fast food restaurant. And then I thought a moment longer, it only took a moment, <laughs> and I said, but I know of lo a lower paying job than that. What is it, he said? You're looking at it. <laughs> now, a ho homemaker and a homeschool mother has many jobs and no salary for any of them. She is a servant, and she is an amateur. Now, here today, we probably have a whole room full of amateurs. But the word amateur doesn't have the opposite meaning of professional. In fact, the meaning of amateur is a wonderful one. Because inside the word amateur is another little word, amour. Now, as I happen to be married to an Italian, I know that amour is amore. And amore means love. So, an amateur does something for the love of it. There is no university she can attend to earn a degree in mothering. Motherhood does not earn her badges or provide her letters after her name. She is an amateur. What she does, she does for love. She labors in love and she's love in return. It is a high calling and this is her blessed vocation. And without this vocation, the world would suffer. Now, many in our modern day society believe that the occupation of homemaker or homeschool mother is a sort of take it or leave it sort of job. It's something that uh, she does when she's not successful at doing anything else. After all, it isn't something the high school guidance counselor would suggest. <laughs> well, I came across this interesting magazine a few years ago titled Reminisce Magazine. It's uh, written entirely by its subscribers, and it's filled with the stories and reminiscences of bygone days. And one woman wrote that during the Great Depression, her family moved around a lot, mostly in places of little to no rent, places without electricity. And though they were poor, and though they were always moving, each place felt like home, because home was where mama was. Now, my husband has had more than a dozen different jobs, and we've moved at least 24 times, and I pray that this is what my children think of me, because if they don't, I feel that my life has been a failure, because first and foremost, I am a homemaker. I'd like to offer you another important principle of mother culture, and that is the majesty of motherhood. Mothers, you are queens of your households. As queen, you are second in command, as father is the king. God has crowned you with authority. 
The day your first child was put into your arms was your coronation day. Together, mom and dad rule in an absolute monarchy. There's a big responsibility to be queen. And it's been said that heavy is the head that wears a crown. Perhaps that's why so many parents today have abdicated the throne of parenthood and are allowing the state or others to raise their children. Or they just let their children do what they think is best in their own eyes. But on the contrary, we homeschooling parents have taken on this responsibility. But there's something so I've noticed over my years of homeschooling. The relationship that develops between mother and her children is a wonderful thing. And homeschool can safeguard this relationship. But there is a tendency in homes when a weary mother is with her children all day. In her weariness, she may give in to too many of their whims and wants. She has very difficult time saying no to her children without feeling that it's somehow unjust. And it is then that the homeschool becomes democratic. In a democratic society, everyone's on equal terms. We're kind of used to that in America. But if the home government is democratic, a certain respect for mother is missing, and her power of authority is weakened. And Charlotte Mason, with her very British and Christian advice, urges mothers to be the queens of their households. A mother ought to serve her children with love, sympathy, and dedication, but also expect from them honor, loyalty, and loving obedience. With this training, your children can be led to more easily respect, honor, and obey the King of Kings. Queens have to keep the peace, and they also sometimes have to deal, well, dole out unpleasant penalties. And several years ago, my 11-year-old son was showing signs of a bad habit. He was grumbling. He was murmuring under his breath. And he was murmuring about his spelling. <laughs> it was his most difficult subject. And he had spent the summer, you know, running around the yard and um, doing his archery and riding his bike. And then it was time for September's usual lessons. And of course, I always start every September in my September mood. And that means spelling. <laughs> <clears throat> but he was grumbling. And I came to the conclusion that I had had it. <laughs> and telling him every day not to complain wasn't working. Let's just say he needed help. So after one complaint, his closet door of his bedroom was open, and my eye caught on one of the many jumbled items that filled his closet floor. Aha, you are going to wear this backpack today, I told him. And you're going to wear it all during your lessons. Well, he laughed at this as I was guiding his arms through the straps. But then I said, and every little complaint you murmur will get you a hardcover book in the pack. <laughs> And he complained about that, so in went the first book. <laughs> he ended up getting six books in his backpack that morning. And he found that the only way to do his math was to sit on the floor cross-legged and sort of prop up his backpack with a pile of books underneath that. <laughs> but it wasn't painful. It was awkward. And it was a burden. And it was meant to be. But to keep myself from getting soft with maternal pity, I said, I don't feel sorry for you in the least. You are only getting what you deserve. And if you went to school, you'd have to carry a heavy backpack on your back like this every day. <laughs> now, aren't you glad you're homeschooled? <laughs> he was very happy to take it off. And as if by a miracle, he stopped complaining. <laughs> now. Since I have reached the age of 45, I have a new thought to ponder. The queen is getting older. <laughs> Her children are getting much bigger, too. <laughs> and I have to you know, remind myself to keep taking that royal jelly. You know, they, have, they sell the health food stores. That's the stuff that they only feed to the queen bee in the hive. You know, that, uh, it's good stuff. The queen must practice growing older gracefully. 
Three years ago, I was shopping in a mall. And as soon as I pulled the dressing room thing closed, a wave of pessimism came over me. And I heard a woman in the dressing room beside me sighing piteously. And then there was another woman who was saying, why am I here? I hate swimsuit season. <laughs> and her friend in the cubicle beside her, I'm, I'm very much an eavesdropper, I'm sorry. <laughs> her friend in the cubicle said, hmm, slenderizing French cut. I won't be fooled. I know that exposing 90% more of my thighs isn't going to make me look slimmer. <laughs> Who do these fashion designers think they are anyway? My heart went out to these ladies who seem to really long to dress modestly. And perhaps there is no place where a woman's body looks worse than in a department store dressing room. Those nasty fluorescent lights overhead casting shadows in all the wrong places. They simply do not do a woman's shape justice. So I browsed the racks, I bought a cardigan, and I went home. <laughs> my, my husband's wondering where these cardigans are all coming from. <laughs> But ordering from a catalog to try on outfits in the privacy of one's own bedroom helps to retain some dignity. As soon as a package arrives, I run upstairs, I lock the bedroom door, and I start trying on my new clothes. The lighting is better for one thing. <laughs> the only problem is that husbands have radar. Have you noticed this? Mm. They seem to always know when their wife is changing her clothes. <laughs> So perhaps you really are in for a more positive experience than that of the department store dressing room. <laughs> now, I believe that every woman ought to keep herself in good health. You've got to keep active, you've got to exercise, but not to be obsessed with trying to look as slim as a clothes catalog model. This can only lead to discontent. So why not replace discontent with dignity? That's what I'm trying to get at. Because the truth is, a good queen, though she becomes somewhat wrinkled and round, will always be adored. <laughs> now, if you're a medical doctor or an aerobics instructor here, um, you might not like what I'm going to say next. <laughs> it's that, in my opinion, all mothers ought to be at least 10 pounds overweight. <laughs> How else do we give our children and husband a decent hug? But wives and mothers are meant to be cushiony and cuddlesome. And chances are, what you like least about your figure is the very same thing your husband most appreciates when nobody else is around. <sighs> it's getting hot in here. <laughs> now, my husband used to joke and call the um, skin cream oil of Olay the oil of old lady. <laughs> And no matter how many creams I use on my face, the wrinkles are still forming around my eyes, especially when I smile. But I read something encouraging on a refrigerator magnet. <laughs> you gotta get it wherever you can find it, you know? <laughs> wrinkles give stronger emphasis to our joy the older we get. You know, Sophia Loren, that gorgeous Italian actress, she had her children, children much later in life, and she said, my children would not like me to have a facelift. Well, of course, now it's the Botox thing. But they say, oh, mommy, don't change. You're so beautiful. And you will always be so beautiful. So, she says, I feel very well in my skin. Because Sophia Loren understands true beauty. And that is the beauty of the person that we're talking about. Agatha Christie, who was homeschooled, and I've been reading her autobiography, and I've read half a dozen of her mystery novels. She was married later in life to an archaeologist, and she said, an archaeologist is the best husband any woman could have. <laughs> the older she gets, the more interesting he, interested he is. <laughs> She's great. Now, although I don't really listen to a lot of country music, I used to live in Nashville, Tennessee, where there's no escaping it. And I'm quite fond of a love song that Randy Travis sings. He says, I'm going to love you forever, forever and ever, amen. As long as old men sit and talk about the weather, as long as old women sit and talk about old men. <laughs> Time pays its toll on the body, makes a young girl with brown hair turn gray. 
but I don't care. I'm not in love with your hair, and if it all falls out, I'm going to love you anyway. Isn't that how every wife wants her husband to love her? The word person is something I'd like you to think about. King David in the Psalms proclaims his wonder of God. You knit me together in my mother's womb. In the National Geographic magazine, there was a story of a recovery of a sunken Roman ship. And when they lifted the contents of this ship out of the Mediterranean Sea, they examined the ancient artifacts. And among the artifacts, they found what appeared to be a doctor's kit with instruments, etc. And upon looking closer at an instrument, they found a fingerprint. It must have been the fingerprint of the doctor. Now, of course, we cannot see the doctor or speak to him because he went down with the ship, most likely. But we know those instruments belong to him because he has his fingerprint on them. And we cannot see God, but we can see his fingerprints upon what he has created. Each lady here today has God's fingerprint on her. She is a person made in his image. And unlike the knitting of my mittens, God's knitting goes beyond the physical. He makes persons. If you are a Christian, you were chosen before the foundations of the world. An overwhelming thought. Yes, your personality is sacred. Therefore, don't ignore it. You are not just a girl on the outside. You are a girl on the inside. For his glory, do not stop growing into the person God is designing you to be. Well, I've tried to offer you a variety of reasons to take part in mother culture. To safeguard your enthusiasm for the big job that you have to do, homeschooling. And mother culture will safeguard this for you. See, enthusiasm is needed for this high office of motherhood. It's an old Greek word, actually, this word enthusiasm. It's en means in, and theos means God. So to the ancient Greeks, en, the en theos means in God. And all those who were enthusiastic were in God. And as Christians, we know the one true God with a big letter G. And to take part in mother culture will keep you en theos. It will help you from drifting into depression and despair. I am convinced that we homeschool moms can be strong, even in hot water. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we can be a potent cup of tea. And we can say, my cup runneth over. It runneth over into our families. It was about 10 years ago that I read a quote by Billy Graham that got me started on this whole concept of mother culture. And I'm going to end my talk with this quote by Billy Graham. He said, mothers should cultivate their souls so that in turn they may cultivate the souls of their children. If we would do the best for our children and our husbands, grow we must. Our growth depends not only on our future happiness, but our future usefulness as well. That's all. Thank you.